Out of every worst gen video I've made thus far, Gen 6 has proved to be quite the challenge, specifically because it's not a challenge. It's no secret that X and Y are some of the easiest Pokemon games to date, but the reasons why stretch much further than you may realize. Kalos is extremely generous. Through nothing other than gift Pokemon, you can have two starters, one of which can Mega Evolve, a Fossil Pokemon, a Lapras, and a Mega Lucario all before you're halfway through the gyms. And that says nothing of all the other Pokemon made readily accessible throughout your journey. You also have easy access to tons of helpful tools like held items, berries, reusable TMs, and the infamous experience share, which starting in these games applied to the entire party. These factors on their own are great enough, but the trainers themselves don't put up much of a fight either. No gym leader has more than three Pokemon, Elite Four members are capped at four, and even Diantha, who has a full team, is barely a threat. There's a lot of other minor factors that make X and Y easy games, but what makes this video challenging in particular is the roster of newly added Pokemon. Generation 6 introduced the least amount of new Pokemon to date, being 72, or technically 69 at launch. Nice. If you take away Legendaries and the Starters, which are all great in their own right, you're left with 57. Then if you remove Pre-Evolutions, you're down to only 29 new Pokemon. With such a limited roster, along with everything at their disposal, picking out the worst of the generation was more difficult than I anticipated. Even the team I used was all in all, not that bad. But I'm committed to this self-imposed responsibility, and so today I present you with the worst Gen 6 Pokemon. If you've never seen one of my worst Gen videos before, why the hell are you starting with Gen 6? Go and watch the others. My definition of worst is based on a variety of factors like the ones listed on screen. Pokemon can be considered bad for a variety of reasons, and I want to highlight a range of these flaws as opposed to dunking on Scatterbug for having a base stat total of 200. Another important note is that I'm avoiding any version exclusives between the two games. In my eyes, you can always make an argument a Pokemon is worth using due to its exclusivity, and this only eliminates Aromatisse, Slurpuff, Clawitzer, and Dragalge, all four of which are good enough to stay off the list anyways. And if I'm saying that about Aromatisse, it should give you a pretty good idea of what's to come. As always, remember that a Pokemon being the worst doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, it's just the worst through comparison. This is especially important in this video because again, limited roster. Lastly, an important bit of housekeeping. Normally I show footage from my playthrough, but unfortunately a lot of it turned out choppy and I really don't want y'all to watch this for the entirety of the video. I was able to salvage a bit of footage, but because of this I won't be able to give you the same Elite Four and Champion battles like I did with Gen 5. I mean, they weren't nearly as interesting as the ones in Gen 5, but that's besides the point. I'm sure a majority of you won't really mind, but as a small apology, I've decided to do something I should have done a long time ago. The tooth is fixed. To some of you that may mean nothing, but to all of you I've mildly tortured over the past year, you're welcome. Okay, with that all said, let's get started. To keep the theme of breaking tradition, I want to start off with two honorable mentions. Neither of these Pokemon really deserve to be on the list, but they're a great way to showcase how limited my options were. The first of which is the Iceberg Pokemon, Avalug. On paper it's easy to pick on Avalug, as base 46 special defense and 28 speed are ridiculously low. Not to mention, its move pool is pretty limited, and it isn't available until right before the 7th gym. But that's really where the negatives end. If you've never used Avalug in-game, I can't express how crazy good its defense is. This thing eats super effective physical attacks like they're nothing. And with positive matchups against Drasna of the Elite Four, as well as most of Diantha's team, Avalug is a pretty decent late-game pickup. There may be better choices, but it's still solid nonetheless. My second honorable mention is the Soundwave Pokémon, Noivern. Quite literally, the only negative piece to Noivern is its availability. You have to wait until Terminus Cave to catch a Noibat, which is not only after the 7th gym, but after you've finished all the story stuff with Team Flare. So yeah, it's super late into the game, but besides that, it's pretty damn good. Solid stats, crazy coverage, and easily one of the coolest designs in the generation. That last one doesn't really matter, but it certainly helps. These two were both candidates for my final team member, but they pretty easily outshined the rest of the team. So instead, honorable mentions. Or maybe dishonorable mentions? Now it's time to truly get into the list, and we can do so on the first route of the game. Well, technically second, but this bullshit shouldn't count. First up is the digging Pokemon, Diggersby. Big Chungus over here is in a really awkward position. 
You can catch Bunnelby at the start of the game, it evolves by level 20, has a variety of moves to use, and has a number of decent matchups throughout the entire game. So why is it on the list? Well, it's because of huge power. This ability doubles a Pokémon's attack stat. It's what allows a Pokémon like Azumarill to go from hitting as hard as Purloin to hitting as hard as Haxorus. Because of how massive a boost a Pokémon gets with huge power, or pure power for that matter, it's important that Game Freak doesn't make their base attack stat too high, otherwise they become stupid strong. And that brings me back to Diggersby. With base 56 attack, a Diggersby with huge power hits harder than slacking. But the catch? Huge power is its hidden ability. There's a few methods to obtain a Pokémon's hidden ability, but TLDR, you can't get a Diggersby with huge power before the postgame. So that slacking level attack is permanently limited to Froakie level attack. This makes a huge impact in a playthrough as you're constantly underwhelmed by your damage output. What? Even late game when you're using moves like Earthquake and Return, you're doing a laughable amount of damage. And what makes this even more upsetting is outside of Zygarde, Diggersby is the only new ground type we got in Gen 6. So if you wanted to use only Kalos Mons, either deal with this ground type or don't have a ground type. I can't express how upsetting it is to use a super effective Stab Earthquake only to be nowhere close to knocking the Pokémon out. You can help offset this by reteaching it Sword Stance with a Heart Scale, but the damage has already been done. Outside of this glaring issue, I can't hate on Diggersby too much. Like I said before, it's available really early, has plenty of good matchups, and is even surprisingly bulky given its stat spread. Plus, Pickup is a really nice ability to have on a high-level Pokémon, as you can get rare candies and Heart Scales pretty easily. But again, we're limited in Gen 6, so even being partially disappointing is enough to label you as one of the worst. Moving on to arguably the best Mon on the list, we have the Royal Pokémon, Pyroar. Just like Diggersby, you might look at Pyroar and think there's a lot of positives to it. And to be fair, you wouldn't be wrong. Its stats are some of the best we've seen in a worst gen video, Litleo is available before you have a single gym badge, and the dual stab from being both fire and normal type can come in handy. Plus it has several good matchups spread throughout the whole region. And while it does have some downsides, I would be lying if I said they were that detrimental. For one, it has the ability Rivalry, which increases damage done to the same gender and decreases damage done to the opposite gender. The inconsistency from this ability can be a little annoying at times, but all you need to do to avoid this is to catch a Litleo with Unnerve. Also, for those wondering, male is probably better than female for this ability, but either way it's just not the move. Another issue is its limited moveset, which makes its unimpressive base 68 attack that much more noticeable. Still stronger than Diggersby though. Even with TMs, your options for coverage are quite lackluster. But again, it naturally has so many good matchups that even just a normal and fire move will prove pretty well throughout your journey. So all this begs the question, why call it one of the worst of the generation? What's so bad about Pyroar that it lands towards the bottom? The answer? Nothing. Pyroar's biggest issue has nothing to do with itself. The issue is its competition. Competing for the role of Fire-type team member, Pyroar has to stand out against Delphox, which hits harder and has a better dual type, Talonflame, which is faster with a variety of helpful moves, and Charizard, which can Mega Evolve. And all three of these are available in the very start of the game too. So between these four options, are you really picking Pyroar? I mean if you did, it wouldn't be terrible, but you'd just spend the rest of your journey slightly underwhelmed, knowing you passed on all these monsters. Honestly, I just feel bad for Pyroar. We finally got a decent, non-starter, early game fire type, and they had to overshadow it with two great fire starters and one of the best regional birds to date. In any other region, these lions would probably avoid the list, but by simply standing against these three, I'm hard pressed to call it anything other than one of the worst options for a fire type. I mean, at least it's not Simis here. By sheer coincidence, our next entry shares the exact same design split based on gender that Pyroar does. The constraint Pokémon, Meowstic. However, this time, I do think one is worse than the other, even if only marginally. And that's Meowstic male. Typical, men bringing down the average. Hope my mostly male audience likes that joke. Meowstic has the same problem many other worst-gen Pokémon have, and that's high speed with mediocre everything else. Mediocre? 83 Special Attack is really disappointing and makes Meowstic weaker than Blossom, Plusl, and Cherim, all of which were in their own worst gen videos. It's usable early in the game, especially given Meowstic's low evolution level of 25, but the further you get into your journey, the less damage your attacks seem to do. 
and this leads me to why Meowstic Male is the worst of the two. Level Up Moves Both Meowstics were very intentionally designed. The females are very attack oriented. They learn a variety of coverage moves like Charge Beam, Shadow Ball, and Signal Beam, which pair nicely with their offensive based ability, Competitive. The males, on the other hand, are designed around support, with moves like Reflect, Imprison, and Quick Guard, along with the hidden ability Prankster. But since you can't get either of these hidden abilities before the post game, the difference between the two is solely move based. And let's face it, there are very few status moves that are actually useful for an in game playthrough, especially a casual one especially in the easiest Pokemon games to date. So instead of the support role intended for it, Meowstic Male is trying to be more offensively based like its counterpart, and it just doesn't quite hit the mark. Especially because Psychic isn't all that helpful in Kalos either. You're only super effective against Gym 3, and from then on you're just hoping for favorable matchups. And when you aren't hitting something for super effective damage, that lackluster 83 special attack shines through even more. Throughout the Elite Four and Champion battles, Meowstic was easily my least useful team member. And the cherry on top is that Esper itself is a Pokemon you might not even run into during your playthrough. It's only available on Route 6 before the Parfum Palace, which is a route you can easily skip past. And if you do go out of your way to walk around in the tall grass, you might as well pick up Hone Edge instead of the ticking time bomb that is Esper. He may be cute, but good lord does he have problems. For the fourth generation in a row, we have the Pokemon company trying to make a new lovable Pikachu clone, only for it to be one of the worst in its generation. Here we have the antenna Pokemon, Dedenne. You know how I just critiqued Meowstic for being fast with little offensive presence? Well Dedenne has worse stats in every single category, except for attack, at a whopping 58. Still better than Diggersby. Dedenne also sports a very shallow move pool, with moves like Dig, Aerial Ace, and Grass Knot being some of your only coverage options. Not to mention, the only fairy attack you get is Play Rough, which again is coming off that base 58 attack. Even Clef Key hits much harder. To offset this, Dedenne has a lot of nice electric moves, but that only gets you so far. Sure, you get moves like Nuzzle, Volt Switch, and Parabolic Charge, but with your underwhelming stats it doesn't take much to stop you in your tracks. I couldn't even one-shot a Gyarados with Thunderbolt. And as if all that wasn't enough, Dedenne is literally the rarest new Pokemon in the region. It's only available on one route at a 5% encounter rate. What's the point behind this? It reminds me of Yanma's 1% encounter rate from Gold and Silver. All this searching and re-encountering for what, one of the region's most underwhelming Pokemon? It's kind of a slap in the face. But you want to know something really embarrassing? I still thought it was better than Meowstic. At least Electric and Fairy are great types for the endgame, both offensively and defensively, although it is a stretch to call this thing defensive by any means. Like with almost every Pokemon I use in these runs, I've developed some appreciation for Dedenne over the course of my playthrough, and it's with that appreciation in my heart that I say, Dedenne, you suck. Speaking of appreciating Pokemon more, my last entry went from my top contender for the worst Gen 6 Pokemon to one I might genuinely recommend. Under the right circumstances, that is. Maybe I should just rename this video to most meh Gen 6 Pokemon. I'm talking about none other than the jewel Pokemon, Carbink. One look at Carbink's stats gives you a pretty clear indication of why it's on the list. Most people don't want something this passive on their team, because each battle will take you that much longer to get through. But a slight time waste aside, Carbink surprisingly has a lot to offer. It doesn't matter if the attack is physical, special, resisted, normal, or even super effective to an extent, Carbink takes it like a champ. And I know I said status moves aren't always helpful when talking about Meowstic, but having Stealth Rock on a team member can be a really nice touch. Again, with the smaller team rosters of most Kalos trainers it won't make a huge impact, but against Wolfric, Malva, Drasna, and even Diantha, it can be very nice to have that extra chip damage especially since Carbink's defenses make it really easy to set them up. Plus its matchups against those last three trainers are especially good. The first two are self-explanatory, and Diantha in particular has four Pokemon weak to Carbink's dual stab. Granted, you won't be doing a ton of damage, but after a war of attrition, you'll most likely come out on top. Again, I can't emphasize enough how bulky this Pokemon is. Even though its HP is pretty low, the defenses more than make up for it. If you're ever playing through a Nuzlocke, and you have an opportunity to use a Carbink, do it you won't regret it. Or maybe you will, because you still have to deal with the lack of damage output, not to mention lackluster coverage, a painfully slow level up group, and a spot in the Pokedex next to this dumbass. So even though it can be good under the right circumstances, just like all the others, 
Carb Inc. is definitely one of the worst. I feel like Gen 6 marks a big shift for these videos. Before there were plenty of Pokemon I was able to call out as genuinely bad, whereas now it's more like, yeah, they aren't great, but they're not unusable. I mean, I say that now, but playing through Sun and Moon with some of the more underwhelming Gen 7 Pokemon may prove to be quite the uphill battle. But until then, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to drop a like and subscribe, and check out some of my other videos while you're at it. And as always, as thanks for making it to the end of the video, here's a picture of my dog. Talk to y'all soon.